In this video, we we'll talk about how to write the qualitative observation and raw data table. First of all, for qualitative observation, it is one thing that is required in the marking criteria. And I, quite, I find quite often that in the past, people always overlooked this and did not even include anything about the qualitative observation. In fact, this part is very important. And one thing you should pay attention is uh, you should really think about what kind of qualitative observation you could have during the experiment. Because uh, once you finish the experiment, you collect the quantitative data. There's no way you can go back in time to look at what kind of observation you can make in a qualitative view. So really try to think through the uh, whole process when you're doing the experiment. The most basic qualitative observation you can always put down is a brief variation trend of your dependent variable with the independent variable. So let, let's say uh, you may find when independent variable increase, the dependent variable decrease, right, or increase, of course. Uh, but then, of course, this is just a qualitative way to say it. There's no mathematical model you could uh, outline by this point. So this one is something that you could always put down. But then I would say this one is the least appreciated one because this is just too general, too simple and not specific to uh, a particular research question. Every research question can write that. More importantly, uh, this is required a higher order thinking. So the first thing is you should check and observe whether during the experiment your physics framework uh, will have any contradiction. So that is to say when you do experiment, uh, throughout the whole process, is there any violation of the assumption that you make? For example, maybe you are doing mechanics question and uh, for a motion that is probably uh, going in 1D, so maybe a vertical motion, but then it actually goes sideways. All right, so that may affect the result and also your prediction according to the physics framework. Or it could be maybe when you're doing a circuit, uh, when you are doing certain trials you find out the components are having a very uh, severe heating effect maybe it gets to be very hot so that could be something that you did not expect in your physics framework also or maybe if you're doing something related to waves maybe uh, there will be some reflection or refraction even uh, that you didn't anticipate in your framework as well so these are the things that you should think through and that is why when you are doing the framework uh, in the very beginning of your IA, you also need to know clearly what kind of assumptions that you should have uh, in order to predict using your physics framework. And if you find those formula online, like from other people's research, uh, you don't just find a formula. You also need to know how they derive it or what kind of, again, the assumptions that they took uh, in order to derive that particular formula. If you could find out anything that actually violate the assumption, that will be very, very useful later on when you try to write the evaluation. The second thing that you should pay attention to is uh, when you do the measurement, is there any fluctuation in the reading? So just like the previous video, we talked about the electronic balance. Uh, if there's fluctuation, then you should uh, also mentioned there's a fluctuation also. Another important thing that is uh, throughout the experiment, uh, there should be a certain control variables that you uh, should take care of. But then are they really constant throughout the whole experiment? And that is the issue, right? Because if the control variable is actually changing, even by very little bit, uh, they may affect your measurement in dependent variable or your prediction or finding out the relationship fairly. So uh, monitoring the control variable, for example, you may just simply think, oh, uh, in fact, the temperature of the room or of the air will affect. So maybe you find out uh, at the beginning, the room temperature was 25 degrees Celsius. And maybe after that, uh, it just changed to 27 degrees Celsius. Uh, that may be something you could also mention as well, like it become warmer simply so these are the things that you should also check uh, what kind of other variables you have in your variable list earlier and then uh, throughout the whole process again you should check it care carefully 
and no matter if you find out it is a constant flaw or uh, somehow it changed unfortunately you should also report uh, in this section under the qualitative observation here for the raw data table uh, we have actually mentioned uh, most of the idea earlier just to reiterate to you again so conventionally we'll put for the first column to be the independent variable and your dependent variable should be on the right hand side and you should have a few repeated trial probably three usually then you should use um, the notation s1 s2 or s3 in this case because it's doing distance right to show uh, this is three different trials other than that, even for your independent variable, you should also include the symbol. So later on, when you refer to, say here, the water level height, you don't have to type water level height this long uh, words every time. You just have to refer to H, and that will be simple. Uh, of course, you should remember to put down the units, all right, no matter what kind of quantity that you're talking about, unless it is it's really dimensionless. The other thing that, of course, uh, you should pay attention and you should include it also, is the uncertainty okay so uh, for raw data most of the time that's the uncertainty will be a constant right because that probably is due to your uh, measurement instrument um, like the, the last or the minimum increment of it so then um, that's why it's usually the same uh, there is a situation where it may not be the same in that case, instead of putting it in the column head, you can actually do a separate column. So for example, if say, um, let's say distance actually uh, is not having a constant uh, absolute uncertainty, right? Just let's say, then what you could do is instead of putting this here, you can actually just set up one uncertainty called Delta S3, let's say if this is for S3, um, and then slash CM, and then you can improve here. So say if this one is still 0 0.2, then yeah, that's fine, 0 0.2. Maybe for the next one, 0 0.3, then put it at 0 0.3. But of course, if you do it this way, later on you have to explain why it is different for each different trial. And lastly, like we remind you earlier, that for raw data, because they are of the same precision, so along the same column, they should have the same decimal point. All right, which we mentioned in the earlier video again so just a remind you, reminder before you move on to process data there's one more important thing that you should do and that is to give the justification of the absolute error and you should do it for each of the absolute error that you mentioned earlier normally you can follow the rule that you learn in IB physics that is if you use an analog instrument for example ruler then you can do the smallest increment divided by 2 for the absolute error and while for digital then you should know it is just normal uh, the smallest increment however other than following this rule I would strongly strongly recommend you to double check with the instrument menu of course if you say oh I'm just using a ruler then of course there's no menu for you to check however if you are doing any kind of vernier equipment there's always a menu you can refer to and in that case uh, it will be very helpful to reinforce the idea to the marker that uh, you, you want them to give you a better personal engagement mark because uh, if you are really into this topic then you want to do everything carefully and check everything carefully so let me show you an example how you can check the menu for the vernier equipment and it could be the same if your equipment is not from vernier uh, there should be a certain menu go along with the equipment itself okay so on google you can actually type uh, the sensor that you use especially for vernier so i'll type say temperature probe vernier and then uh, you should be able to find out different pages so usually the first few will be relevant one so i'll i'll go for the first one and then once you uh, finish loading, you see uh, to double check whether the picture is really the mm -hmm. one that you use, of course. And then after that, you can scroll down and there should be some tabs you can click, say uh, specification, should be the one that is relevant here. Then you can see that uh, it will tell you actually for different range of temperature, they have different resolution. That means the smallest increment. 
At the same time, they will also tell you another thing that is called the accuracy, and that is to say, uh, at a certain temperature, maybe the random uncertainty should actually be treated as plus or minus 0 0.2 or plus or minus 0 0.5 degrees Celsius instead. So that may be much larger than you think, uh, and I would say it's, it's really up to you whether you want to follow this one or the one that you originally think of. Uh, however, mentioning the fact that you have tried and checked this will be very helpful, again, for your personal engagement. And more scientifically speaking, if the menu here said, oh, actually accuracy is just 0 0.2 degrees Celsius, then I guess you cannot take it up to, say, 0 0.03 instead, because you should always take the larger uncertainty uh, when you're doing a research. However, in some cases, I know that if you take this one, then your error bar will be extremely large and you cannot deduce anything. Then in that case, uh, you may need to do a small discussion on this, why you want to stick with these or why you want to stick with the resolution itself. Um, and that will be appreciated. And lastly, like I said in the previous slide, if there's any fluctuation in the reading, so for example, when you do the electronic balance, it's 1, 2.34, but then sometimes it changed to 7, like 3, 7, sometimes it changed to 3, uh, 2, let's say. So what you can do is, uh, you can either, in your methodology, say you would observe and take the maximum and minimum value for a short period, so maybe like 5 to 10 seconds. And then uh, say in this case, that will be, in this case, it will be 12.37 and 12.32, right, to be a maximum and minimum. So then you can use the half range method to find the absolute uncertainty in this case, instead of just saying, oh, uh, 0 0.01 is the absolute uncertainty. In fact, you can actually add them up together because uh, when you read 3.7 or 3.2, it could be plus or minus 0 0.01. So then uh, you should add the range of that. The other way of doing it is, uh, if this is like the case, then uh, if you are happy with, you can just take uh, what, whatever you have earlier and it gets the last digit. Because since it is unstable, you can just ignore it and then you can take 12.3 instead. So both ways would be fine. Uh, it's really up to you how you would like to do it.